Hello, everyone. Welcome to the Professor Messer A Plus Study Group for October of 2012. We've got quite a bit of content to go through this month. You've been so nice to send in your cards and letters and questions. I have an enormous spreadsheet again this month with all kinds of information. We'll be able to get through a little bit of it while we are talking today live. I have a lot more questions to go through. Maybe we'll do a shotgun session where I go through a lot of that. If you are watching live, then there is a chat room on the Justin TV stream that we are on. There is also on the Professor Messer website a chat at the bottom. I've opened up a group called the A Plus Live Study Group. So you're welcome to go there and leave your questions as well. I'll be glad to address everything that I can. Everything sometimes scrolls by very quickly, but I'll certainly try to do that. We're going to focus today on our A plus certification. And this is really something I'm able to do every month because you're able to also support the site. If you'd like to know more about our offline videos, of course, you can watch everything online for free. But some people like to take them with them when they're off of the internet. You can find out more on the Professor Messer website at professormesser.com slash download dash a plus. I think I've got that one right. If you already have your A plus certification, you can certainly use this presentation as part of your continuing education credits if that's the way you're doing it. If you're renewing it just by taking the next certification, maybe you're working on your Network Plus or your Security Plus, you'll be able to have the renewal that way. You may not necessarily want to do CE credits, but if you are, this certainly applies as well. And another thing that I'm going to do today is uh, have some interactive sessions. I have things like this, this question that asks, how long have you been studying for your A-plus certification? And I've got a QR code on the screen right there. You're able to take a QR code reader from your particular machine and be able to bring that up. You've also got a number here. You can just go to vote.rs, vot.rs and use the number 975187. And I guess I should consider doing that as well. That's one of those things that I did not do. I'll bring this up in a moment. I need to go to that very page myself and see what is there. Let's pop up a window so that I can show you some of some of this information. That would be pretty useful. Here we go. Now we can see uh, the number. Let me make it a little bigger so you can see it. Vote.rs, that's the wrong number, isn't it? I brought up the wrong piece. So that's not going to help any of us to get there. That was, I think that was last month's to have it there. Let's bring up this month's and get the right number there. Uh, da, 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 da. I will type it in and log into my session. Here we go. Let's show this one. That's a little bit better. Now we can see. So those of you on the stream who are watching live can participate today. I'm going to have more questions, more Q&A. If you go to vote.rs and type in 975-187, it will take you to this page. It's vote.rs. 975187. And this gives me an idea as we're going through this session today so that I can understand more about how much you've been studying for these pieces and the things that you've been working on and get an idea for some Q&A that we'll do later on. I'll do some pop quizzes and we'll we'll step through some pop quizzes that I've made up that are associated with the questions that you've sent in to me. So I also try to make sure we're able to look at those things as well. And it's a nice mix this time. We have a number of people that are watching live. We've got quite a few that are in the chat rooms. Of course, not everybody has to participate in this. But you can see a pretty good mix. Certainly uh, less than a month up to six months tends to be an interesting range. And then I always notice there's people that come back after a while and say, you know what? I, I dropped this off, but I want to get back into the A+. plus. I want to keep studying. I want to do some other things. And so we also see those 9 to 12 and even more than a year out there. And it doesn't matter. This stream, I think, will help with any of those pieces because we're going to drill down into specific questions from the A plus certification exam and exactly all the things that are there. So quite a nice mix. Thanks for participating with that. I'm going to uh, have a look at some of these the big questions you sent in. We're going to come back to this in just a moment. But a lot of the things that you send in to me are, are very broad questions as well. So I want to, to really take a step back and think about what have we done with this exam? Because if you if you look at this, 
Um, there's a lot that's happened with A-plus in the last month. In fact, the last week or so. One of the things you may have noticed is that the brand new edition of the A-plus certification exam is now live. So the 220-800 series, the 220-801 and the 220-802 are exams that you can take right now. You can sign up. You can take the exam and get the latest version of the A-plus certification. Now, if you've been studying for your 22701 and 22702, those were updated about two years ago. Those exams are still available. So you've got a choice. You can take either one. And it doesn't matter which one you take. Uh, you just have to make sure you pair them up. If you take the 701, you cannot take the 802. Conversely, if you take the 801, you cannot take the 702. You either have to take both of the 700 series or both of the 800 series, and that's it. You can't mix and match those pieces. So you have to keep, keep that in mind because what's going to happen is the 701 and 702, as you can see here, they expire on August 31st. And when they expire, they're gone, which means if you've taken the 701 and you've waited around and you've not taken the 702, and then September 1st comes along, that's too bad. You now have to start over again. You now have to start over and take the 801 and 802. So you don't want to be in that situation. You don't want to take one of these exams and then not take the other 701 or 702 before the expiration because when they go away, they go away. You can't get those back. So keep that in mind. If you want to see what's new in the 800 series exam, if you go to the Professor Messer website, I have a new section of 800 series videos. And at the top of that page is a link that takes you to a video that explains what is different between the 701, 702, and the 801, 802 series. So that should give you an idea. Of course, you should always download the exam objectives. They are on CompTIA.com. And that will take you there, and you can look at the 800 series exams. Also at the top of that video page is a link to this the exam certification requirements. So one-stop shop. You go to the top of my video page, you can get all that information from everywhere you want. Now, one thing that is different in the 800 series exam is a brand new type of testing. Most of the exam will continue to be multiple choice. But what CompTIA has announced that they are doing is adding new questions that are not multiple choice. In fact, there's a wide variety of perf we call performance-based questions. I don't know if performance-based is really the right term for it. It's more of matching questions, not really fill in the blank so much. But there are sections of that that will bring up a command prompt and ask you to perform a particular function. You'll need to type in the command that they're asking for at that prompt. So a lot more hands-on on this newer A-plus certification. I guess anything would be a lot more hands-on. There were zero hands-on before. A lot of people said, this exam is OK. I, I do have to remember things. I have to know a lot about operating systems. I have to understand how to do this. But it's not really testing me on what I know. Well, those days are over. It's now, it's now testing you on what you know. So you're going to want to really make sure that you understand those particular pieces. If you, uh, There is a video, a very good video that CompT has created where they step through all of the different exam types. And if you go out to, I made a quick link for us, bit.ly, bit.ly slash exam dash test. Write that down so you can have a look at it. Exam dash test from bit.ly. Um, that will take you directly to the YouTube page that has that video on it. And they go through all of the different types of questions. They go through the entire exam experience. You're watching someone take the exam, and they're showing all of those different exam types. And the, the concept of performance-based testing is a little daunting to think about. But once you watch this video, it makes a lot more sense after that. I think there's a, a lot there that you'll have to, to worry about. In the chat room, folks are saying there's two par parts of the test. Uh, is there a time frame required between them? Nope. As long as you take both of those before they retire them, you're fine. You could take the 801 right now, and you can wait two years and take the 802 as long as that 802 is still available. So keep that in mind as well. Let's do another pop quiz. So uh, let's let's get things going. Now that we have all understood, let's, let me flip back to that page so we can see it. There's our final view of studying for our A-plus certification, a good mix on that. But I have another question for you. And this other question deals specifically with RDP. We're going to do kind of a networking port-based question, since this is one of the questions that you will be asked on the 800 series and see what's, what's going on with those. What port is commonly used for RDP 
So of course, you do have to know what RDP is. There's a big clue. And then you have to know what port number is used for RDP. This comes directly out of the CompTIA exam requirements. Do not answer in the chat room. This is something you should answer online by going to vote.rs, vot.rs, the number 961071. 961071. And I'm going to pop over there myself and bring up that screen. So the question is, and I'm going to give you some options so it's not as bad as you might think. Your options here. And boy, I, I made this one a little bit tricky. I didn't make this one as easy as you normally might expect. What port is commonly used for RDP? Is it UDP 3389? Is it TCP 3899? Is it TCP 3389? Is it UDP 3989 or is it TCP 3999? Now, this is very common to the types of answers you'll get on the A-plus certification exam. On some of my daily pop quizzes, I answer or put the answers that sometimes are very broad. In fact, the, the A-plus exam probably would have a TCP port 80 or a TCP port 440, 443 on here just to give you something that looks a little bit different. But notice I made these so close to each other. So you really have to know to get this particular question right. And as you can see here, as uh, as people are voting at vote.rs at 961071, I love that somebody, after a few minutes, saw that UDP 3989 was just getting no love. And they said, you know what? I'm voting for that one. I know nobody's picked it. We're, we're just going to jump in there and get it. And you're anonymous after all. So of course, you could choose that. But you can see. By looking at this, I didn't fool most of you. In fact, this middle number, TCP 3389, is the one that is used for remote desktop. So you should feel good about yourselves. And if you didn't get that one exactly right, now you know everybody wins on this particular question. TCP port 3389 is the port that is commonly used for RDP. No piling on now. I gave you the answer. So you're, you're now just answering because you know the answer. You can't fool me. Let's go to some questions you've sent me. You send me, uh, when you sign up, you register for this a study group every month. I ask you to give me one question that you would like to have answered in the study group. And I get quite a few <laughs> quite a few questions. I get hundreds of questions. Plus, I get some that are sent to me in email. I get some that are sent to me in the chat room that is always there 24 by 7 at the bottom of the page at professormesser.com. So we have quite a few there. One of the questions, and this is one that comes up all the time, is there a simple way to remember the various chipset sockets? And I'm assuming here this question is really referring to CPU sockets because on the A-plus exam, the only type of socket you really need to understand and memorize are those associated with CPUs. Are there any mnemonics? Are there any tips? NH asks this. Thanks for the question. This is, this is probably one of the questions I get the most because it really is just memorization of the CPU sockets. Now I have um, some, there are some changes. So if you look at the 700 exam series requirements, you'll notice that they really don't tell you which sockets and which CPUs you should know about. There are certain types of sockets. That's not really what people are worried about. It's relatively easy to memorize a slot or a PGA or an LGA. There's not a lot of different types. But there are specific things you'll need to know about individual CPUs. And on the 700 series exam, they didn't tell you which CPUs were important. You just had to guess. In fact, some of these books that you've seen have pages of charts of CPUs. Uh, I see these and I start to cry. Who would ever want to memorize all of that? So as part of the 800 series exam, if you look at those exam requirements, you'll notice, finally, they list out all of the very specific CPUs that you should be familiar with. So finally, that huge number has been shrunk down quite a bit. And if I do have in my 800 series videos a video that takes you through all of the Intel CPUs and all of the AMD CPUs. And they summarize in this view. This was a, It's a great view. This is a chart that came directly from the GTS Learning books. We'll talk more about GTS Learning in a bit. They have some great materials with GTS Learning. And you can see 
one of the things that is there is we've got uh, a nice view of the Intel processor perspective here. You can see that there are different sockets, socket T, socket B, socket H, and socket H2 that are used in different types of processors. Notice one thing with Intel. This will help you quite a bit. So here's a tip. You asked for a tip. I've got one. The type, notice that land grid array is the type that is used on the processors that we need to know about. So already we know, without having to do any work, that every single Intel CPU uses LGA. And of course, uh, knowing when these are released helps. I don't know if we're gonna, really going to be asked about the exact date of release, but it helps you understand how these evolved over time and the type of memory that they use. Notice that these are some relatively new CPUs, I'm talking in the last year or two. So again, brand new exam, brand new materials, all this information is really some of the latest that you can get. Now, conversely, AMD has a different set, a little bit larger set here, as you can see. One thing that's interesting about AMD is that most of their CPUs go right into pin grid array type sockets with that, that zero insertion force uh, socket type that's on the motherboard, except for one. They have one that's really made for 64-bit server systems, this Athlon 64FX, and it uses LGA. But that gives you an idea anyway of the differences between them. And at least you can say, for the most part, all Intel, LGA, and AMD, except for one, is PGA. So there's one place where you can start to see differences between them. And quite honestly, even though it looks like there's a big list here, a lot of these sockets are very, very similar to each other. A lot of the CPUs that go in these, very, very similar to each other. And if you watch the video that I have on CPUs, It'll be very apparent. It'll be very clear. There's not going to be any question about that piece. So have a look at those sockets and those pieces that are there. It is a bit of memorization, but it's nice to know the, the process that we've made of using different sockets and the CPUs that went into them and what we're doing with those CPUs. And it certainly helps if you're building out your own desktop, your own server, you're buying a motherboard, you're trying to understand. Buying a motherboard, it says I need an AM3 Plus. What is that? I have no idea what they're talking about. Well, once you will go through this video, you'll know exactly what they're talking about. Let's take another question. One came in from TM that says, can you please explain the concept of parity with regards to memory? And, and actually, the idea of parity, of course, is not just done with memory, but also parity is something that we deal with with hard drive arrays as well, especially RAID arrays that are set up for redundancy. And we did one of uh, these sessions, I think last month we talked about RAID parity, but let's, let's really look at what this means. And I'm going to look at a specific kind of parity today called even parity. And even parity is one that, that talks about having the even number of bits turned on versus perhaps what you might think of an odd parity. Now, an even parity we also think of as XOR. So if you're doing any programming or you work at all with doing binary calculations, XOR is probably going to be a type of calculation that you are very familiar with. But let's figure out how this works then. Let's say you have some information, and it's a bit of information. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, and eight. I have eight bits here. That's a byte, obviously. So now I have these eight bits. The way that even parity works is that it looks at the, the entire byte here, in this case, these eight bits that are on the screen, and it looks at them and says, I need my parity to be even. I need the number of ones to be an even number. So it calculates the number of ones. One, two, three, four. There's four ones. Those four ones, that's an even number. So if I had to come up with parity for this, I wouldn't add a number one to this. That would be odd. I'm going to add a zero to this. That keeps the parity even. That's my parity number right there on the end. It comes in very handy. Let's do another one of these. If you have a, a byte that comes through, and that byte is 0, 0, 001, 0, 0, 0, 1, 1. Let's count the number of ones. One, two, three. There's three ones in this mix. So there's your three ones. I want to know what the parity would be for this. Well, there's three ones. If I wanted this to be even, I need an extra one thrown into this mix, and there it is. Now I have parity. What happens is we send this entire bit, 
down the line, or we store it somewhere, we send it to the next place along the line, and it examines this and says, well, here's the byte, and uh, and there the parity at the end. Let's count the number of ones. One, two, three, four. Hey, it matches. My parity works out. There must not have been any corruption along the line. This looks fine with me. That's a very common, simple way to check for this. Obviously, there are other ways to do checks, like uh, checks of MD5 or a SHA-256, that's a little bit outside the scope of A+. However, dealing with just parity makes it easy. One last one here. One, two, three, four. I have five ones. So to keep my parity going here, I need to add another one to the mix. It's really just that simple. Those types of configurations, very, very simple to be able to figure out the parity that's associated with those. Uh, let's do some more of these. If I look at this, is the parity correct? in this byte. If we look at the byte, the, this, this series, the byte and the parity that's on here, I count the number of ones. One, two, three, four, five. Is the parity correct here? Well, we're expecting even parity. There are five ones. Therefore, that one that's there is not correct. If we receive this, we would say parity doesn't match. You need to resend me that data because this does not calculate property. I'm not sure where. In here, it's not calculating property. I can't reconstruct it. But I can obviously say, this is not correct. Please send that data again. Let's do another one. Is, does this match even parity, this byte that's at the bottom? 1, 1, 1, 1, 0, 0, 1, 1. And there's a zero byte, a zero bit at the end for the parity. Does that match parity? And if we look at that one, we can count the number of ones. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6. I think 6 is an even number. Therefore, the 0 that's on here is absolutely a good number to have. And let's do one last one. Here it is, a, a byte 1, 0, 1, 1, 1, 1, 1, 0. And then I have a 1 here at the end. Does the parity, is the parity correct? If I receive that byte with the parity, would that be correct? And if I count 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7. That's definitely not an even number. That is an odd number. Therefore, parity doesn't match. And I'll have to ask whoever sent this data to me to resend that again. That's it. That's parity. There's really not much more to parity than looking and calculating that way. That's what your computer is doing every time it receives data where parity is important. That's what your memory is doing when the data comes in. So if anything gets scrambled, that parity is something that's going to, to work out just fine. So that's one thing that I think that uh, thinking about the calculations involved, there's a lot of calculations going in and out of memory, it absolutely is. But that's one of the things that we always have to deal with when working with parity. And that's exactly how it's calculated every single time. There is uh, folks in the chat room. I think we're going to continue on. Parity seems to be something that we're all OK with. So let's move on to this month's. TMA. And the TMA, of course, is this month's acronym. We need to go through and, and learn more about acronym and what's going on. And one of the biggest acronyms, one of the brand new acronyms that is on the 800 series exam, sort of a retro, because it's an acronym that was on the 600 series. It was not on the 700 series. And it's back on the 800 series. And that acronym is this question, what is SCSI? This comes from uh, CS. Do not answer in the chat room because we are going to vote on it at vote.rs at 505455. The question of what is SCSI? S C S I. It's an odd name, isn't it, for something, especially an acronym. And it is pronounced SCSI, even though it's not exactly spelled that way, but it's close enough. S C S I is something we would pronounce SCSI. So keep, keep that in mind. I don't know why we do that to ourselves in our industry, but occasionally that's just one of those things you run into. Now, I've given you some options as to what SCSI might actually be. Is it the small computer systems interface? Is it a system configuration and system integration? Is it a serial communication systems interface? Or is it a systems communication serial integration? Put a bunch of serial communication integration computer words in there, didn't I? There's a lot in there to work with. Um, so one of the things when you're working with different disks, especially different interface types, is in the past, especially in the 700 series, we had PADA, which used to be called ATA, which used to be called IDE, which in some cases was called EIDE. But PADA is one of those. SATA is, of course, one that we commonly see in desktop computers these days, and even in server systems as well. And then you have SCSI. SCSI's been around 
for quite some time. And we're seeing a re resurgence of SCSI, not necessarily in a physical disk form, but we're seeing SCSI used a lot in our virtual machines, especially virtual servers and those that have a lot of disks associated with them. So if we look at SCSI, and I think I didn't fool very many people with what we have here, but SCSI is the small computer systems interface. That is the one that almost everybody answered on this one, the small computer systems interface. Nobody, nobody went for system configuration and system integration. I didn't fool anybody with that one. Although serial communication systems interface, it was that systems interface at the end I think I, I hooked some people on. But clearly, small computer systems interface is the one that we were looking at to determine what SCSI is. So in the chat room, in fact, someone answered, uh, you know, why are SCSI drives more expensive than this? Well, that's a, a good question. And to answer that, I think we need to understand more about what SCSI really is. Now, although we call it the small computer systems interface, it's not really small. We're using it in some of the largest servers that we're doing. At the time, it was in comparison to drives and storage that we might have on mainframe computers. And in respect, you, you compare the two, a mainframe versus a server, server does seem small, but certainly not that way any longer. What we wanted to do with SCSI, and this is one of the nice parts about SCSI, is you can string together many different peripherals all together. So you could plug in a hard drive, and if you want to plug in another hard drive, you can string it along. We'll talk about the different methods of doing that in just a bit. But very, very simple to have that happen. And there's a lot of different formats. We've been using SCSI for many, 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 many years, well before SATA was even thought about. We had SCSI drives. This is something we used along with, in some cases, ATA. In some cases, we wouldn't have PADA drives or SATA drives in our computer. We would just have SCSI drives in our computer. And there are a lot of different formats. Uh, as the, the standard evolved through the ages, the speeds increased. And every time we had a new set of speeds in that standard, we'd give it a different name. It's fast SCSI. No, now it's ultra SCSI. No, now it's ultra wide SCSI. Now it's ultra two SCSI. So, we would just add those up and have a lot of different types there. One that's relatively new, SCSI over IP, iSCSI. You'll see that a lot when dealing with remote storage systems, and you need to communicate to the SCSI communication over a network setting. So you're not physically plugging in a SCSI cable. You're just connecting up your gig Ethernet port, and that's communicating to the SCSI that's out there. But it's using the SCSI protocols over IP. Pretty nice, huh? You can imagine a data center that can be very, very, very valuable. And there's even more things about SCSI that are really nice. You can plug in a lot of different kinds of per peripherals. At, at the time where we didn't have USB, we did not have standard formats for plugging in these peripherals. We would plug in scanners and CD-ROMs, and we'd be able to connect them all together, and hard drives, and connect them all together through a SCSI connection. Made a very simple standard interface to plug those devices in. You can put a lot of different devices strung together. On those older systems, I could only plug in eight. On the relatively modern SCSI, it's hard to find one that will only do eight devices. Now pretty much everything will handle 16 devices to string those together. And a lot of the very complex operations of SCSI are built into the interfaces themselves. You don't have to do a lot of configuration. SCSI is able to communicate between devices. That's another reason those drives are a little more expensive, is there's a little more intelligence inside of them. And therefore, there's a higher cost associated with that. It's been around forever. It's something that you will find your oldest systems might have SCSI connections on them. And the one thing that people are always so concerned about, and it's really not that big of a deal at all, is the termination of a SCSI connection. If you have all these things stringed along, at the end of the string, you have to terminate it. You have to tell the SCSI bus, this is the end, so the data can reflect back and everybody can see that. You effectively put a cap right on the end of it. Sorry, we're done. No more of that. Puts it right on the end. A lot of the SCSI termination pieces are built right into it. One of the challenges you'll find, of course, is SCSI has so many different interface types. You're going to see a lot of different interfaces. One that we're, we're about to look at are these high-density 68-pin type connections. You'll find these big type of connectors, these 50-pin type of connectors that go on the end that have latches on the side. They look a lot like the Centronics 
it technically is a Centronics, just a wider version of that, a 50-pin version of it. Sometimes you look just like a serial connection. These are really, really old. You don't see very many of those anymore. The faster SCSI buses need a lot more than what those 25-pin what DB25 might look like. But you sometimes will see those out there occasionally. If you look at even a computer that's been around the last five, six, seven years, the SCSI connection on it, in fact, you can see on this one, there's a floppy drive. There is right here an IDE drive or a PATA connection. And right here on the same motherboard is a SCSI Ultra 3 right here. If we look at this a little differently, we could look at it from the side. You can see it's got all those pins on it. So that is your SCSI connection. If you saw a connection like that, that is very much a SCSI connection. That one is very, very obvious that it is SCSI. This is for internal drives inside of a computer because it's coming right off the motherboard there. If you looked at the cable, it has those same high-density pins that are on it. This is the connection on the left side. I would plug into that motherboard port. But, but right here, right next to these, you've got a lot more connectors. They're just stuck right under the ribbon cable, one connector after the other after the other. If we look close, it's the same connector. And there's just a bunch of them on the ribbon cable. That's pretty common inside of a, a computer case because you might have three or four or five or six or more hard drives inside of a single computer. And you can use the same cable to simply connect them all together. When you're connecting these things together in SCSI, whether it's internal or whether it's external, we refer to that as a daisy chain. And that's referring to this idea of taking daisies that you might pick and you can put a put a hole in the stem and run another daisy through it to make a bracelet, to make something you would put on your head. You can see that's very common. It's very, very old to do something like that. And we've just taken the term daisy chain. And now that's something that applies right into SCSI. You would have your controller. We were just looking at this, plugging into my motherboard, then having a connection into a hard disk, same cable. We're extending the connection. There's another interface on the cable. There may be many, many more. We can just have a bunch of interfaces on the cable. There they go. Lots of interfaces. But at the very end, we need a terminator. Sometimes the terminator is built into the device itself. And you can simply say, this hard drive is the last one in my daisy chain. I'm going to push a button on the hard drive that designates that this is terminated right here. Maybe it's a jumper you might set on the drive itself, or might be a physical termination. That's a physical terminator right there. So it looks a little bit different than SATA. It looks a little bit different than PATA, but it's not so hard to set up. You just have to make sure you get things like ID numbers correct. Every device has its own ID number. So you would assign the ID number within the SCSI device. This is a, a very old SCSI device, but it's one where you can really start to see that ID number. And again, the SCSI ID for the older devices will go up to 8, 0 through 7. You might have other devices that are relatively new. You can have up to 16. But you can see right on the back of this one, you can put on the SCSI ID. You specify by pushing these buttons up or down what the SCSI ID might be. So we'd configure the ID. We'd power it up. We'd plug it into the SCSI connection. And that's the ID for that device. We have to make sure that on a daisy chain, every ID is unique. Usually your controller is ID 0. So you might make 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, and go forward from that. Very, very simple. Very, very easy. That's it. That is that is the configuration for SCSI. Not so hard, really. Very, very easy to get that going. Makes it Makes it very, very simple. The drives themselves, there's the same type of connection on a drive that I would plug into. That SCSI connection we were just looking at. We can see the power for the drive, the big Molex connector, the four-pin power that's on that SCSI drive. And we can see that big SCSI connection looks exactly like the SCSI connection we saw on the motherboard. Very, very simple to see that there. It's connecting it up, very, very easy. You can see this type of piece here. You can plug right into the motherboard. That same cable winds around. I plug it here. I could have plugged it in here. I could have plugged it in over here. Doesn't matter, as long as it's connected to that same cable we're absolutely fine with that piece. Very, very simple. The, uh, the In the chat room, somebody says, wait, I thought the controllers were supposed to be 7. There is no specific number for a controller. Most controllers come set up as, as 0. Uh, some controllers might come out of the box as 7. Some controllers might come out of the box as something completely different, as long as it's unique. Every device has to have its own unique ID number. Very, very, very important to make sure that's there, or else you're going to have conflicts and your devices are not going to work. 
So one of the, another question in the chat room is the the IDE cables. There's PATA cables that looks very similar to a PATA cable because it's the same type of ribbon cable, but in actuality, it's a completely different cable configuration with a completely different number of pins. This is not a 40-pin cable for SCSI, so you cannot take your PATA or IDE cable and use that for SCSI. You can't take your SCSI cable and use it for PATA. In fact, you can kind of see from here, it's got all these interfaces on here. We know a PATA cable has a connection to the controller and then two other connections for the hard drives, and that's it. So a great advantage you have with SCSI is I can have a lot more than just two devices on a single controller. I can plug in a bunch of devices to a single controller, and that makes it so much easier when you're dealing with something that you want to work with. And if you're working with SCSI, that's all you would have to know. There is also, of course, since this is a, a new topic in the 800, sort of a, a refurbished topic from the 600, there is also a SCSI video available in my list of 800 series videos. So you can absolutely look at that as well. And I think that's one of the things when we work with uh, some of these technologies and we're concerned, is this going to be hard? Is it going to be something I don't know about? In actuality, working with, with these types of scenarios, working with these technologies isn't that difficult. It's really more fear of the unknown. If you don't know it, it seems like it's going to be really hard. And then you read about it and you think, well, that's it? You mean SCSI? We're finished? We, we've gone through everything we need to know about SCSI for the A-plus exam? Yeah, just in a few minutes. That's all you need to really, really know about SCSI. There is another section about SCSI that deals with numbering the logical units and the physical devices themselves. You want to be sure to read up on that. In my SCSI video, we talk about that piece as well. So that that's a piece that I see coming along and, and working and, and being important to work with a lot in there. So we'll also look at those pieces. Uh, as, as you look at the videos, go through all of those sections. Make sure you understand those pieces. I think it's going to be important for your new A-plus exam because it is a new topic, and you could absolutely be asked about it. One of the questions that came in was also about laptops. What does an express card on a laptop, whether it's 34 or 54, this is referring to millimeters, uh, bring to laptop functionality? It's DD that asked the question about this. If you have a laptop and you'll notice there might be an expansion slot on the side of the laptop that these, these fit into. And you'll notice there's different sizes of express card that are used for these pieces. So the question here is, is there different? Do I want 54? Do I want 34? What if my laptop only has 34? Am I missing out? Is there a problem with this? And the, the reality is, no, you're not. The, the actual size of this is something that inside of your computer is exactly the same interface. Look, look at the express card that's here. You've got an interface here for the 34 millimeter and an interface for the 54 millimeter, exactly the same interface. So the functionality of how it connects to your laptop inside, if you looked inside of your laptop, yeah, it looks exactly the same. Same interface. The reason they have the option for the larger size is so that you can have more electronics in there. Sometimes they'll even have more stuff sticking out the end. They try not to do that on these express cards because they're going right into your computer. Uh, but that is one thing that is very, very common between those. There's, there's all kinds of different cards you can get for this. Here's a good example of a USB 3.0. Maybe you've got a laptop. It has some of the, the older pieces that are inside of that. You don't have any USB 3.0 connections. Here's a nice way to add on the capabilities of, ex, of ex, uh, expanding your USB. Now you boom, you've got USB 3.0 just by adding an express card interface. Or maybe you have um, the need for more storage. Here's an express card. You can slide it in and boom, you've got 32 gig SSD right there on this 32 millimeter express card interface. Or maybe you want to connect your laptop to a connection to receive television signals. You might want to get something like this 56 millimeter. This is a Win TV, so you can plug it in. And you've got a TV tuner built right into your laptop now. And that's just by adding in these additional cards. That's the beauty of ExpressCard, is being able to take capabilities that you didn't previously have on your laptop, and now you can do so much more with it just by adding these interface cards. It's just the same as if you bought it a full-sized PCI or PCI Express card and you put it into a desktop computer, same idea. The only advantage here, obviously, is I don't have to break apart my laptop to somehow slide it in there. I just slide a card right in, and I'm connected. Very, very, very simple to get that running. Very, very nice to have. And if you're working on a laptop and you need more power, that might be a good way to do it. 
So no difference between those express card types. You don't even have to worry about that piece. This is a great time also to mention that some of our sponsors for this A plus study group are our folks at GTS Learning. GTS Learning has a 220-800 and an 801 and 802 exam in freestyle. You can go through their entire book. You can look at all their Q&A. And as soon as I finish my videos, all of my videos are going into the GTS Learning book itself online. So you can be reading their book online, and my video will simply be embedded right into the book. So you don't have to hunt around for different videos. As soon as you come across a topic, you can watch the video right there. They also have a lot of Q&A. They have sample exams online that you can take. Freestyle itself, very, very useful. I'm going to pop back over and give you a feel for what this looks like. I probably am uh, am timed out, so I'm going to going to connect back up again. I'm going to log in. Yes, well, I cannot access that. Let's log back in on my freestyle login. I think I have, I don't think I have the A play, latest A plus in here, but I'll show you some of the things like the network plus that's in here. There's sample exams inside of it. The entire book. Here's a great way to be green so you don't have to print out anything or drag books around with you. Here's the uh, ability to go through and look online at all the things you might want to know. And again, even though it's a book, you can see the same information you would get from a written book is in here. My videos are in here as well. And uh, that's one of the things. Can we can we even hear that? If you get there, in office, hey, there it is. One of the things you'll notice is above your head, there's a fake ceiling. It's a drop ceiling. That hey, is that's a nice fella. So you don't have to hunt around or do cross references or figure out where this material is. It is all on the GTS learning side. If you'd like to learn more about that, absolutely go see the professormesser.com slash exam practice. We'll go to the freestyle exam practice that they have. If you want the full-blown thing, go to professormesser.com slash freestyle. You can also go to professormesser.com slash GTS learning. That takes you all, all of those will take you to the GTS learning site. Just remember freestyle or GTS learning or exam practice. Put that at the end of the professormesser.com. And that also helps support the professormesser.com website. And I can keep things up and running and keep doing videos for you as well. So they also have a free trial. So you don't have to take my word for it. Go on over there. Try it out yourself. If you like it, talk to them about getting the full-blown piece of it. And I like their materials too, or else I would not be helping to promote what they're doing as well. Nice bunch of people over there. I spent a lot of time with them and looked over their, their materials. So this is something I have put a lot of time and effort into as well. So let's now change our focus a bit. This is the time of the month where we talk about questions about the questions, questions about the exam itself. I get probably just as many questions about that as I do actual pieces of the exam. One of the questions is, how far apart should you take the A+, 701 and 702? And of course, this also applies to the 801 and the 802 as well. This is a question I get a lot. Uh, the question that's an adjunct to this is, do I have to wait a certain amount of time or does it have to be within a certain amount of time between those two? And I talked a little bit about this earlier, but the the piece that I always recommend is if you've never taken a certification exam before, don't take them on the same day. Because you've never been to the test center before, you've never sat down and read through the prerequisites that you have to, to fill out or, or at least a uh, agree to prior to taking the exam. It's kind of a nervous experience. You're you're not used to the exam environment of exactly how to mark things and what it's going to be like or even time frames associated with it. And of course, if you're studying for two exams at the same time, it's a lot of material to have to study. Sometimes taking a single exam can help a lot. Once you've already gone through the exam experience, then you're fine. Maybe maybe you just take both of them because you've studied up all of the materials. You're comfortable with the process. Maybe you would like to take them on the same day. Many people will do that. But if you're just starting out, I don't recommend doing it on the same day. At least have some time between those so that you don't have to worry about those. And in the chat room, some people are saying, I'm taking three months apart. Some people take them six months apart. Take them when you're ready. Take them, Look at the materials. Study the materials. Be comfortable with one of the exams. Make, go ahead and book that exam. Boy, when you book that exam, that's when it's on, isn't it? That's when you know that you have to be ready. Uh, and you can walk in there on the day you're ready to take your exam, take it and and pass that particular exam. And because you were comfortable, there was one thing to do that day. Now, how far apart? Maybe you take the 702 the following week, if you know the materials, maybe the next day. But you have a gap between so you can take time to think about the process and have all of that 
sort of soak in so that you can understand it a little bit better. Some people want to, they take a lot of time. Maybe you take the 701, something happens in your life. You have to move. You have to, something changes. You, you're now studying something else. But later on, you want to come back. As long as the exam is still being offered, you're fine. If you took the 701 and in July you want to take the 702, that's fine. You can, you can wait as long as you would like between those exams. There's no time ticking away. There's no clock. There's no, no delays or penalties for waiting all of that long. The 702 exam and the 701 exam expire on August 31st of 2012. So you have less than a year to be able to see all of these exams. So keep that in mind that you want to be sure that you're able, of course, to take the exam. You don't want to take the 702 and then realize, I can't take the 701 anymore because it's not there anymore. That's a little bit of a problem. You don't want to run into that situation either. So I have a plan in place. Make sure the exams are going to be available when you want to take them and go ahead and book that first exam. I think you'll be fine. In the chat room, one of the questions is, and this is a, a common question as well, which one is harder? Is the 701 exam harder? Is the 702 exam harder? Now, this is a different answer than the 800 series. So I'm only going to talk about the 700 series for this exam. The 701 is what we call the essentials exam. It's understanding uh, how to do basic identification of hardware. It's understanding the different Windows versions and the differences between them. The 702 exam is the practical application exam. That's the exam that applies how to resolve problems, how to troubleshoot. So the question is going to be, which one is going to be harder? Well, if you aren't comfortable, you don't know a lot about memory, you don't know a lot about CPUs, you have no idea what all of those interfaces on the back of your computer are, but you've done a lot of troubleshooting with Windows, maybe your 701 exam is actually going to be harder. If you're somebody that understands the hardware itself, you've been replacing systems for a long time, but you've never really had to troubleshoot a network. You've never really had to troubleshoot a Windows 7 boot problem before. Maybe the 702 exam is going to be harder. So it really depends on what you know as to which one is going to be more difficult. And I think uh, look at the if you look at the exam requirements, I think if you understand the exam requirements, you'll be able to look at them and understand which one of these is going to be a little tougher for me. I keep going back to talking about downloading the exam requirements. Downloading the exam requirements, it's really, really important. That's why at the top of every exam index, every video index on the Professor Messer website is a link for downloading the exam requirements from CompTIA. Pretty, pretty nice, pretty important to be able to have that here. Here's a question I don't get a lot, so I thought I'd make sure I'd stick it in the study group this month. Do you get penalized for wrong answers on the CompTIA a exam? OB sent this one in. It's also, as an adjunct to this, a lot of people ask, how do I calculate the percentage of, num of questions I have to get right or have to miss to be able to pass my exam? Uh, what is that about? Uh, how do I figure out that piece? There is not a there is not a percentage. You'll notice that the CompT exam is graded between you either get anywhere from a 100 to a 900. What is that about? What is why why what is that? Can't we just have a percentage? Can't we make that the number? And obviously, CompT is not telling us how they calculate all of this. Exactly. But we have a pretty good idea from things they've told us in the past. When you take the exam, you start at 100. And for every question you answer correctly, you get a certain number of points. Every exam question has a different number of points you might get. So there's no way to calculate a percentage because every question does not count the same. Some questions count more than others. Some questions have zero points associated with them. And CompTIA tells you this when you're about to take the exam, is that we might ask you something that is off the scope of our exam requirements document. They think that, that they might be asking something in the future, so they run it across you now. So you may get a question that hits you right out of left field, like this was not on the videos, this was not in the book, there was no study requirement for this. Where did this come from? Came right out of left field, and that's okay. CompTIA, that's, a, that's really the case. CompTIA put it on the exam to see what your answer might be, to get a feel for how familiar you might be with it so they can then decide whether to use that type of question in a future exam. So that's one of the challenges you have is you, you don't know 
how many of those you can get right or wrong because the harder questions we think are probably worth more points. The questions that are probably easier are probably worth fewer points. So it's going to be pretty important for you to try to get as many correct as you can, all the way up to 900. So depending on the exam you take, you need to get a 625. You need to get a 700. You need to get past that point for that to be able to make that happen. And of course, it's random every time in the chat room. Don's saying, I saw some crazy questions in the 701. I didn't see some crazy questions in the 702. It's going to depend. It's a random set of questions that you're going to get. So that's one of the challenges you have. Uh, some folks also asking, so when you get to the end, oh, to answer this question also, do you get penalized for wrong answers? No. If you answer it wrong, you get zero points. So if you don't know the answer, don't leave it blank. Just guess if it's multiple choice because you've got at least a chance of getting that right and getting those points at the end when they start to calculate those. So absolutely answer every single question on the exam, all of them. Do not skip any. Do not leave them blank. Very, very important. At the end of the exam, you will know immediately if you passed or if you failed. You'll get a screen that says, hey, congratulations. We're printing out a, a copy of your exam results. Go pick those up at the front desk. Or they'll say, sorry, you didn't make it. Sorry about that. We're printing out a copy of your exam results at the front desk showing the things that you didn't do well. Now, it doesn't go into a lot of detail about what you missed. It shows the domains of topics associated with that, networking, operating systems, those types of things. And it will tell you how many percentage-wise or numbers that you got right based on that what was there. So it's giving you a little bit of insight as to things you did well on and perhaps the things you did not do well on. So you should be able to tell very quickly. I've taken some exams, not the A+, plus, but there was a, a cabling exam I had to take many moons ago. I took it once. I failed it. And they gave me the sheet of paper of what I missed. So I went back and studied. Took it again. I failed it again. But I was better. I saw the numbers were a little bit higher. So finally, on the third try, that was the charm. Finally went back in. Didn't didn't pass it by a lot, but I passed it, and that's the important part is that I passed it. But it gave me that feedback that you need to work on these topics. So don't just, if you fail, don't just storm out of the place like, oh, man, I failed. I'm very upset. Make sure you grab that piece of paper. Make sure you know exactly what you may have missed, what sections you might have not done well on so that you can go back in with much more knowledge about those pieces. Question in the chat room is, all right, so if you don't pass, and you got to take it again. Do you have to pay again? Oh yeah, you got to pay again. You got to you got to pony up. Here's my another another bunch of monies to take this exam again. You take it and pass. You pay your money. You take it and fail. You pay your money. So that's another good reason to be very motivated when you walk in the door. You don't want to fail that. You want to go right in there and and get get into that piece. So very very important to be able to do that. Uh, of course, you can find me on Facebook at professormesser.com slash Facebook. You can, of course, find me on Twitter, professormesser.com slash Twitter. And find me on YouTube, professormesser.com slash YouTube. Find me on Google+, professormesser.com slash Google+, G+. Just stick a bunch of things at the end of professormesser.com. You'll be fine with that piece. I have GTS Learning to thank for sponsoring this. You can find out what they've got going on at GTS Learning. You'll go to professormesser.com slash GTS Learning or professormesser.com slash exam practice. And then we're going to do another one of these in November. So feel free to tune in again. You can keep track of what I'm doing at professormesser.com slash calendar. And I will be uh, making sure all of these questions and many more will be answered next time on the study group.